Welcome to the second Statistics Office Hours. Um, if you haven't seen the first one, my name's Sander. I'm the TA for Stats. I got a five on the exam last year. Um, so I not only kind of, you know, really know the material and really enjoy the material, but I also know, but I also, you know, struggled with learning during those first months of COVID. Um, so um, it is my goal to kind of help you throughout this um, new year um, and new kind of era. Uh, to help you get the best score you can. Uh, so obviously, follow us on our socials. Um, usual deal, things are posted there. Tons of great new opportunities this year. Um, so um, today, what we're going to do is, um, so first, I'm just going to go through unit two, just kind of a basic lecture going through each of those key concepts. And I'm going to do some practice FRQs and then open question time. Uh, obviously, that might get cut short um, since no one is here. All right, so unit two is about exploring two variable data. So if you remember from two weeks ago when we looked at unit one, that was about one variable. So now we're going to look at you know what happens when we look at um, collecting data on more than one variable. Um, so we've got this kind of continuing idea. Let me get my pointer out so, because uh, that variation can be random. So just because there is a change between two things does not mean it's significant. Um, and that's kind of, once again, like I mentioned about the last week, this is the big, uh, one of the big kind of key concepts in statistics is figuring out if differences in the numbers that we see actually mean something um, you know, in terms of, um, you know, can this make, can we have this make, uh, uh, can we make this, a, you know, a legitimate conclusion um, about the data? Uh, and welcome to whoever just joined. Um, so first we're going to look at how we can represent two categorical variables um, graphically. So these are kind of three of the most common ways um, that we can represent um, data graphically uh, for two variables. So on the left, you can see we've got this multiple bar um, bar chart. So this one's actually kind of the timely one. This is graph of voter turnout and who they voted for in the popular vote. So you can see that we've got, whoops, well that one of our variables here is the year. And then within each variable, we've got what party they voted for. So um, that's one way. Obviously, you can see one of the drawbacks here is that if the data aren't particularly close to each other, it results in a particularly ungainly graph. But the one advantage of this type of bar chart is it gives you a good way to um, compare both variables kind of in an easy graphic way. So you can see trends in overall in terms of all in terms of just looking at one variable, like number of people who vote, but you can also see trends in individual um, in, in um, your other variables as well. So here you can see trends based on who's voting for what party. Um, here's another, this is called a segmented bar graph. So rather than having a bunch of different lines, we see that we've got um, one line per one variable. So in this case, I can't remember exactly what this is measuring, but we've got one for the year. And then this is broken up into three um, different or three or four different chunks depending on the second variable, so the data. Um, and then over here we have what's called a mosaic plot. So a mosaic plot is basically a two-dimensional bar chart in that we've got each variable on an axis and then the kind of dimensions of each of these boxes will tell you um, how much will tell you uh, what your values are. So this is a graph of, of topics of songs on I think the Billboard Top 100. So you can see here we got decade and then here we've got topic. So, so you can see, for example, um, the number of songs represented here by the width and then here uh, the number of songs about that particular topic. So kind of an interesting more two-dimensional area-based way to view that. And then this is kind of the most important concept um, in my mind from this unit, and that's this two-way table. So a two-way table basically 
is a chart that gives you actual numbers um, that allows you to kind of calculate things about the data. So here um, we've got um, you know this. I can't remember exactly what uh, this variable is, but we've got you know various activities. So dance, sports, TV, and then here we've got um, the gender of the person, so men and women. And you can see that this basically allows you to see what each combination is with um, the totals written along the sides. So these are really useful to determine association. So one of the big concepts from this is relative frequency. So this is kind of the one that you can, one of the characteristics that you can uh, use to represent two categorical variables. And I should have prefaced this by saying all of these, these charts and such, these are for when you're looking at two categorical variables or one of each. Um, as you remember from two weeks ago, categorical variables are ones where you don't assign a number to them or where they fall into certain categories. Um, so we've got marginal relative frequency and conditional relative frequency. So these are two kind of measures or statistics that we can calculate about this data um, to prove one point or another about it. So um, you can see here, for instance, the marginal relative frequency is looking at one variable relative to the total. So the marginal relative frequency of men here would be 20 and 50 or 40% or 0.4. Whereas the conditional relative frequency, if you think about conditional, that means that there's something, you know, condition, there's a condition that needs to be true. So it's basically given that this, how many this. So given that someone is a woman, what is the probability that they prefer dance? So if we given that, so if we're given that it's a woman, that would be 16 out of 18, not 16 out of 50, because we've got that conditional frequency, which means that it's just based out of, um, you know, the condition, um, or rather, sorry, I did that. It would be 16 out of 30, rather. Um, because we're saying given that there are women, so only looking at women, what's the probability of dance? And so given that dance would be a woman, that would be 16 out of 18. Uh, whereas marginal would um, be looking at relative to the total. Um, so that's kind of the big difference. Marginal is looking at out of the population or just a group, one variable out of the population, whereas conditional is looking at a specific cell divided by your row or column total. Um, one moment, please. So if we are looking at, oops, sorry, technical difficulties here with the Zoom account. All right, here we go. So if we're looking at two quantitative variables now, moving on to that, um, what we need is we need bivariate data. So we're looking at data gathered with two um, variables, and they're both quantitative. So here we've got it's called an explanatory and a response variable. Um, and so the, the explanatory variable, uh, you might uh, think of this in like science class as your independent variable. And then your response variable, well, that would be your dependent variable. That's what is kind of, that's what's um, being affected by our explanatory variable. And the reasons we're using these terms is because frequently in statistics, we're independent and dependent, like in science, you're actively changing one thing. You're actively changing uh, how much of a chemical you're adding. Uh, whereas um, with um, statistics, you might be just looking at two sets of data. You're not actively changing one. You're just seeing if there's some sort of association uh, between the two. Uh, and that's where um, uh, these, this terminology comes into play as kind of a more neutral thing. So um, to do that, we use scatter plots to represent these. So we've got the um, explanatory value on the x-axis, 
and then the response variable on the y-axis. So um, how do we analyze two quantitative variables? So this is basically saying when it asks you to describe or whatnot, this is what you're supposed to do. So these are the four things that you need to remember how to comment on. So you need to comment on the form, you need to comment on the direction, the strength, and any unusual features or outliers. So, and then there's a specific thing. So um, kind of category that they want you to describe within each of those. So with the form, is it linear or is it nonlinear? Do the data seem to follow a straight line or not? So you can see here, this graph of uh, eruptions of the Old Faithful Geyser in Yellowstone, we can see our explanatory is how long it lasts and the response is how long between the eruptions we have. Um, and so we can see that um, as you know, at, it's a pretty linear trend, even though it's pretty diffuse, and we'll get to that later. So, and then you want to comment on the direction. So is it increasing or decreasing? And the words we use are positive or a negative association. So a positive association means as one increases, the other increases. And a negative association means as, as the explanatory increases, um, the response decreases. So that would be a negative slope if you think about it in those terms. Um, and then so we think about strength. Um, so that's, is it medium, weak, or strong? So basically, how close does the data follow that trend? And, you know, when you're just describing it, you won't, um, you don't have to use any specific statistical measures. We'll get to that later. Um, so here, um, you would just say, well, this isn't, it's actually relatively strong, even though the data um, is pretty scattered. There's still a pretty strong linear association. So you're looking at, you know, kind of how close does it form a line, not necessarily how um, how precise the data is. Um, and then any unusual features. So you can see here we've got two clusters, one at around two minutes and one at around four and a half minutes. Um, so now looking at correlation. Um, so the so correlation is a quantitative way of expressing how closely these two values are aligned. So we've got this really com complicated formula. And so basically the formula for calculating correlation is one over the number of um, values in the sample minus one times the sum of any all of, so, so the sum of value um, of any values uh, 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 value with variable x minus the mean of variable x over the standard deviation of that one times that same um, units uh, value with variable y minus the y's mean over the standard um, error, and that's a really complicated formula. And the thing about it is it requires lots adding up lots of numbers. So if you would have to add up 25 numbers, if you were, um, if you were doing a set with um, 25 units um, with a sample size of 25. Um, and so that's why you'll frequently use this on your calculator. So to do this on your calculator, you just put it in two lists, then you go stat, calc, linrag, and it'll tell you the R value and make sure your stat diagnostics are turned on in your mode settings. Um, All right, um, and so there's a scale because of this one over the sample size minus one. The R will always be a value between negative one and one. So negative one is a perfect negative association. Zero is no association and one is a perfect positive association. Um, so the way to think about that is um, just it's positive and negative associations are the same as slope. So to think about how strong it is, don't think about how big or small it is. You got to think about the absolute value, of course, because you know something can be perfectly negatively associated, um, and that'll have a, a um, and so uh, an R value of negative one, whereas um, something with a value of 
negative 0.8 will have a stronger association than something with 0.1 because it's closer to the extreme. Um, and you know, you've probably heard this phrase, this phrase is tossed a lot around in colloquial English, so correlation doesn't imply causation. So just because you've got a high correlation constant doesn't necessarily mean one is caused by the other. In stats, you know, we're always really kind of hesitant to say this caused this. We always say we have evidence to support that this caused this, but never kind of underestimate the power of coincidence. Um, so now looking at linear regression, linear regression means we're finding um, some sort of representation, um, some sort of mathematical model. So generally this will take the form of an equation. So here we a linear equation to um, predict the value um, if we determine that something is linear. So we're using x, the explanatory, to predict y, the response. And our equation is given by y hat equals a plus bx. Now, you probably are really familiar with y equals mx plus b. That's your point slope um, equation that you've probably been doing since algebra one. So what exactly this means is y hat. That hat means we got a predicted value. It's because obviously, so if we look at this, these green dots are the data. Green won't give us the exact value. It'll only give us kind of based on the general trend what we think it will be. Um, and then we've got intercept A plus the slope times X. And the reason we think about it that way rather than MX plus B is because we're thinking about it, you know, from a starting value, what do we have to go up? Um, so then we look at this concept called residuals because we've got to think about, okay, if we've got a regression, how good is it? So the formula for that is the actual value minus the predicted value. So Y minus Y hat. Um, and that will tell us whether it's an over or underestimation. If it's positive, that means um, the predicted value is smaller than the actual data, so that means it's an underestimation. Um, and then if we look at a residual plot, if the residuals are random, like they are here, it is a um, good linear model. Whereas here, because the residuals, this residual plot follows this par parabolic pattern, it's not a good linear model. So basically, the, your litmus test to determine whether a regression model is good or not or is whether the residuals appear to be random. All right, so that kind of moves on. Well, how do we find our best um, regression? So that's when we do this thing called the least squared regression line. Um, so that is the best possible line fit for the data. And the slope is given here by the correlation coefficient times the standard deviation of the response over the standard deviation of the explanatory. Um, and this kind of ensures that this will best match the trend of the data. And if we square R, that's called the coefficient of determination. So this square, you can see that's where we're getting the least squared regression line. Um, and that is the percentage of variation that is explained by the model. Um, the least squared regression line will always contain the point um, x bar comma y bar, so the so it'll contain the point given by the two means, and then your y intercept is y is the mean of y minus b times um, the mean of x. And frequently, you'll be asked to do things with um, this computer printout of a regression on the AP exam. So they'll give you this, and they'll ask questions. So how do you read it? Well, we've got um, for anything, we'll always have a line for the constant and we'll have a line for the slope. So in this case, it's miles driven. Um, so this is maybe, you know, a starting odometer plus miles driven um, on average per day or something. Um, so this will be um, our A value, so our y-intercept plus, and then our slope will be here, this 0.16292 times x. So for this case, it would be y hat equals 38257 plus 0.16292x. And another important thing to remember is that if you're given a specific thing for what you're predicting, then it would be that hat. So if this is predicting miles driven, then it would be um, you know miles driven under that hat to indicate that it's the predicted value. Here we've got the standard deviation of the residuals, and then here we've got that r squared. So this would tell you that 66.4% of the variation is explained um, by this model. All right. Um, so now we're going to look at what happens 
if our model departs from the standard linear um, model that we're using here. Uh, so we've got two kind of ways that data can be extreme. We've got outliers and this new concept, a high leverage point. So an outlier, practically speaking, in terms of regressions, will be a point with a large residual. <clears throat> so it will be a point that um, has a large, um, so if the residual value is large, that means it's an outlier. So in practice, that means it's a Y value that's far from the mean. Uh, whereas we've got this high leverage point, which will be a point with a X value that largely differs from the mean. And what that is, the reason it's called a leverage point is because it will greatly affect um, the slope of the data. So it'll greatly affect your linear regression. So you also want to remove those because they're perhaps even more crucial than outliers because it will greatly affect what the trend um, of the data is. So how do we, um, you know, kind of normalize, so to speak? How do we make um, regressions if they're not quite linear, if those residual parts aren't normal? Um, how do we make them make a good linear model for them? Well, one of the things, this big tool that we can use is um, taking the log of one of the variables. So um, this is something that I'll probably get into more on a future stream um, or video because it's a pretty complex topic. But basically, if, if um, the residual plot of x, y isn't random, you can try taking the log of each one of these or a combination of the two. If log x, y, if that graph has a random residual plot, then it's logarithmic. So it'll be of this form. Um, vice, if it's the other way around, then it's exponential. And if the log of both, then it's a power model. But practically speaking, you won't actually need to write those equations. You'll just need to be able to write the linear equivalent. Um, all right, so now um, we're going to switch gears and go over to some FRQ practice from previously released questions um, from the College Board. Uh, so, and always, if there, um, always feel free to put questions in the chat if you have them. And um, I will take a short intermission now as I need to get something to drink, but I will be, be right back in a few minutes and then we will resume with some FRQ practice. So hang, so hold on. All right, so let's get to some FRQ practice. All right. Um, so just a brief reminder on how um, the FRQs are scored and timed. Um, so unlike other classes, AP stats or FRQs are scored on um, sort of a three, each part is given sort of a three scale, um, a value on a three scale. So questions are either essentially correct, partially correct, or incorrect. Um, and uh, so the scoring rubric will give like, if they get this much, it's essentially correct. If they give this much, it's partially correct. And if they give this much, it's incorrect. Um, so basically, practically what that means for you is always show your work. Um, don't put down anything that you know is wrong, but always show as much as you can um, so that you can demonstrate that you are using the correct methodology to arrive at your answers because you can still get partial credit even if you don't know how to do everything. And then each FRQ part will be given a score from one to four based on this score. So like if you have all parts essentially correct, then it's a four. If you have you know all but one essentially correct and the other one partially correct, it's a three and so on and so forth. Uh, so you will have 65 minutes for your first five FRQs. And that breaks down to 13 minutes for FRQ. And then you'll have 20 minutes for the final FRQ, which is a bit of an expanded thing. It's called the investigative task. It doesn't explicitly cover um, anything that's been covered in um, stats. It's a bit of a kind of a connection. So um, it's good to practice that type of question early um, because it kind of connects multiple units. Um, so there's no one set way to study for them. And then just kind of a note, uh, the College Board has said that for this exam season, 
they will be um, done um, as close to the traditional way that AP exams has been done in the past. So prepare for a full exam of MCQs and FRQs. All right, so for our first FRQ, this is a bit of a unit one review. So we've got um, this histogram describing the sizes of 20 rooms in a student residence hall. Uh, it's summarized in this histogram. So um, based on this um, histogram, uh, write a few sentences describing the distribution. And if you remember my acronym, here's hint. So I'll give you about 30 seconds to think about that one. All right, so basically what this is asking you to do is just describe the histogram. So using this cusp BS center, unusual characteristics, um, shape and spread. So the center um, of the distribution we can see here is between probably gonna be between 200 and 300. Um, unusual characteristics, there don't seem to be any outliers at least from this size of histogram that we can see here. Um, shape, you can see it is some, it is pretty symmetric. You can see we can fold it down the middle, but we've got these two humps, and that means this is what's called bimodal. Um, and then spread, the range is between um, 100 and 350 square feet. All right, so for our next part, um, Determine whether there are outliers and then use the grid to sketch a blocks plot. So I'll give you a second to kind of think about that one. All right, so first figuring out, are there any outliers? Um, so what we're going to do for that one is use our 1.5 IQR test. So that means if there's a value more than 1.5 in our quartile range or less than that, then we have an outlier away from the median. So we've got our median here of 253.5. Now what's the IQR? Well, that's Q3 minus Q1, so 292 minus 174 is 118. Now to find the 1.5 IQR, we multiply that by three halves or 1.5. So 177. And we can see that 253.5 plus or minus 177 is within the minimum and the maximum. So we've got no outliers. So if we were to draw a box plot, we would say, well, we've got the minimum here at about 134. Apologize for my poor drawing. Then we go up here to quartile one, go all the way up to quartile three. And we draw our whisker out to the maximum. And then we draw our vertical line at the median of about 250. All right, so, and then question C is a bit of a kind of a further thinking. So what characteristic is apparent from the histogram but not the box plot? So if you compare, so if you compare the two, you can see that the box plot doesn't tell us anything about the shape. So the answer to that one was the box plot reveal, um, reveals that it is um, bimodal, whereas the, um, the box plot does not, or rather the histogram reveals the shape, whereas the box plot does not. All right, so now moving on to a new FRQ, this one based on this um, sec, uh, based on unit two. 
So read over it and give a think about part 1A. All right, so this asks us to identify and interpret in context the estimate of the intercept. Uh, so if we look at our chart, we can see that the intercept is estimated at 72.95. Um, so what does that mean? So basically the way to say an intercept, it is, you know, it is estimated, you would say it is estimated that Y value, um, if X is zero is value. So what does that mean? So we would say, well, if there's nobody in line, it is estimated that the average time to finish checkout is 72.95 seconds. All right, now moving on to parts B and C. Uh, give those a quick thing. All right, and so this first one asks us to identify and interpret R squared. Uh, so we see that R squared is 73.33. Um, and we remember that that kind of explains the percentage of variability um, explained um, by um, a percentage of variability in the response variable explained by the explanatory variable. So in this case, this means 70.33% of the variability you know, of the time it takes customers to finish checkout is explained by knowing how many people there are in line, are in line using this regression model. Um, okay, so now thinking about part C, um, identify um, the outlier. So obviously you've probably been circling outliers on graphs since you were in elementary school. So you can see the outlier is this point at x equal to three. And this is an outlier because the predict, and you've got to explain why. So you can't, so you would have to say, and you've always got to explain why in context. So you'd say, well, it's because the it's because the predicted time for three customers in line is actually much higher than what was actually true there. Um, all right, so moving on to our final FRQ again with these new two variable quantitative relationships. So give a sec to read over this and I'll be back in just a little bit with the answer. All right, so let's think about what the answer to this might be. All right, so in this case, we don't have a graph, but we're asked to describe what is meant by these words, so positive, linear, and strong. So what does a positive association mean? Well, we've always got to explain it in context. So a positive association means as, well, as the explanatory increases, the other increases, the uh, response increases. So that would be, you know, 
as um, the length of wolves increases, the weight of wolves also increases. Linear would mean that it changes by a constant amount. So as um, the length of a wolf increases by one, the weight will increase by about the same amount. Doesn't necessarily mean a one-to-one -one ratio, but it means something pretty close. Um, strong, that means that it will fall pretty close to a line on average. So now we've got this equation uh, for our least squared regression line. Uh, what does that mean? What does the slope mean in context? Um, so this would mean that you would say, well, on average for an increase of one meter in length, um, the weight will differ by 35.02 kilograms. And kind of key things to remember are always include specifically what it means. Don't just say one, an increase of one in X will result in an increase of 35 in Y. Uh, you've got to include what exactly we're measuring and also your units. So in this case, meters and kilograms. Um, so here um, we have, this is a bit of a little bit more complicated problem. Um, so given a length of this, this is the residual, what was the actual weight? So remember our residual is our difference between actual um, and predicted. So first we would use the equation to plug in our value for 1.4. So that's 32.56. Eight kilograms, and then we know that it's off by negative point nine six point negative nine point six seven. So we would add that, and we would get twenty two point eight nine eight kilograms. So that's just kind of an introduction to some of the FRQs that you might see um, uh, based on these unit one and two concepts in the exam. All right, thank you for tuning in or watching the recording. Um, so I'll probably post what's next in the channel. Um, so probably in another two weeks, we might go through unit three, do some more FRQ practice. So I hope you have a good week.